Thank you, Kenny, for inviting me and having me here. I am just so heartbroken that I'm here in the Boston area, COVID positive. I so was looking forward to come out and to see everybody. So, hi, everybody. But I'm sorry that I'm, I'm here remote. So we'll do the best that I can in this capacity here. You know, today what I wanted to talk with you about is the... Um, the role that chemistry, again, has in the future of sustainability. But I want to start with my disclaimer that I don't claim to have any gifted insight. I don't claim to have any answers to any of the world's problems. I've been doing what I've been doing for almost 40 years. I've come to look at the world in a certain way with a great deal of vulnerability. I'll share that with you. But please, if I ever sound so presumptuous that I'm telling you the way you should be thinking, no, just know me that that's not what I'm it, is, it works for me. And if this works for you, then this, this is wonderful. And I'd love to have any conversations that people would want. And so here we are today. And we have so many approaches to what we call sustainability. There's, you know, responsible care and circular economy and resilience and green chemistry and cradle to cradle. There are so many different approaches. It's almost hard to keep track of all of them. But what makes me sad is when we have um, this polarization in our world that someone says, well, this is the correct way to do things and this is the incorrect way to do things. And man, you know, we don't need this conflict. Every single one of these approaches has merit. We humans are a diverse species. The problems that we face are very diverse. Every one of these things is important. What's critical is to see how it all fits together, not why one is better than the other or anything like that. So I'm going to try to share with you my perspective of how all of these approaches have to come together. Okay, so obviously we're in a world of products. What we want to do is we want to have these products stay in use and reuse as long as possible. If we can do that, then that's really wonderful. That's the highest form of sustainability we can do, right? And so Let's look at this from a human-built perspective and from a natural perspective. In the natural world, all right, there are things like termite mounds. Think about this. Termite mounds are so large, the networks can be seen from space. And they last for well over a century after the termites are long gone. Talk about adorable good. There are less durable things like hornet nests and bees' nests, or things like the hermit crab. He didn't make that shell. The, the little guy, he gets bigger, and when he gets bigger, he leaves that shell, finds another shell. When he gets bigger, he finds that. And they use and reuse these things that they didn't make themselves. That's not too different from the human-built world, where we make durable goods like car parts, or we make, you know, playground parts, or we want cups of things that we use and reuse. And this works pretty good. The thing to think about when we look at this system of the use and reuse system is that we want to maintain the structural form of the thing and we want to maintain the chemical composition. As long as we can hold the form and the composition steady, we can use it literally forever. But that would violate the fundamental rules of thermodynamics. Inevitably, entropy is going to enter the picture and something bad's going to happen and it breaks. When that happens, what we need to do is to go counterclockwise on our image here. We have to essentially, where did those products come from? They came from materials and components that we manufactured the products. But we also want to then mechanically recycle those products back to the materials and components. I call this the assemble and disassemble cycle. Now, again, if we think of the natural world, in the natural world, essentially we've got, you know, a bird will build a nest. What will they do? They'll pick up the, t the twigs and the branches and the little stuff and they'll make their nest. And then that nest will, will function. They'll have the eggs. The eggs will go. And then interestingly enough, if the, the bird wants to form, use that nest again, they won't. They will disassemble it. They'll toss all the pieces around. Maybe they'll go and pick up those very same pieces, maybe different ones. But they won't reuse it as is. They will disassemble and reassemble it. 
nature does it. There are a lot of examples of this assemble disassembly in nature. Now we humans, what we do when we make plastics like for health care and things like that, we make these plastic objects that have been injection molded or formed. And then what do we do? We recycle them by grinding them down and turning them into pellets. Then we take those pellets and we reform them into the plastic objects. Or in the paper industry, we take sheets of paper, we then grind them down into pulp and then we reform the paper. And so in the same way, we assemble and disassemble things. When we do this now, what we're doing is we're altering the structural form. We're letting that change, but we're trying to keep the chemical composition constant. And as long as we can keep the, the chemistry constant and just have the structure form, then we can do this, this mechanical recycling assemble and disassemble system. But again, entropy is going to enter the picture. And every time we mechanically recycle the plastic or the paper, we break some of the chemistry. And when we break that chemistry too much, it doesn't work anymore. So now we have to go to the next system here. And so the next system here is essentially where did those materials and components come from? Well, we synthesize them from molecules and ingredients. And when we want to return them, we take those materials and components and we, through what I call molecular reprocessing, we back, make back those molecules and ingredients. In this system, I call the materials metabolism. And this is where I'm most passionate. This is where I feel is the unmet need. This is the thing we humans really haven't embraced enough yet. So let's look at this closer, okay? So here are my three cats. I'm a Star Trek nerd. It's Odo, Dax, and Pearl, okay? And so these cats, what happens when an organism eats food, okay? We take large molecules in through catabolism. Get it? Catabolism. Uh, we make small molecules. We turn proteins into amino acids. We turn carbohydrates into sugars. We turn fats into fatty acids and things like that. But that's not all. Think about it. When we ate our breakfast, when we ate our lunch, not only did we break molecules down, but at the same time, we then built bigger molecules through anabolism, right? We grow hair. We grow fingernails. We grow blood cells. So we not only break molecules, but biology simultaneously breaks and makes at the same time. But even more cool, Think about this. If we were designed by humans, if biology was designed by the current state of awareness of humans, we would only have proteins for breakfast, we'd only have carbohydrates for lunch, and only lipids for dinner, because heaven forbid we can't mix these things. You know, everything has to be separated in its own little bins. Biology in nature does not tolerate mixtures. It embraces mi mixtures because that entropy of mixture is the driving force. It allows us to couple the molecularity of chemistry with the energetics. Food is fuel, right? And so the magic of biology, the magic of nature is that there is this one molecule, for example, it's called ATP. ATP, you see these three phosphate groups there. I know this is I'm gonna not chemistry nerd out on you too much, but the thing about ATP, do you see these phosphate groups? Those yellow areas there are highly negative. Negative charges don't like other negative charges, so there's a lot of potential energy in this molecule. These phosphate groups are very uncomfortable. And so when we have a process in nature where we eat food and it gives off energy, we charge our molecular batteries by pushing these phosphate groups together. When we need energy, when we want to lift weights, go walk and talk or do something like that, then we break off those phosphate groups. So biology over 3.8 years, billion years of evolution has created the way to couple the molecularity and the energetics by charging our molecular batteries. I would argue that we humans haven't come close to imagining this yet. And if there is a future for sustainability, it has to come from this concept, okay? Because here, there are no degrees of freedom restrictions. We're allowing the structure to change, and we're allowing the chemical composition to change. So let's continue the diagram here. All right, now 
Where did those molecules ingredients come from? Well, they came through extraction through natural resources. And then if we do a good job, we can degrade them back to natural resources. This is what I call the regeneration cycle. All right, in nature, of course, we have um, beavers will cut down trees to make dams. Bees will extract pollen. In so many examples in nature of this process, we humans, we got a long way to go, okay? The mining and the forestry and the, the petroleum industry is so far away from a model like this without true innovation and creativity and some humility learning from nature. We still got a long way to go, all right? And then finally, the natural resources, we want them to be maintained in some stable ecosystem. Close our eyes, go to a happy place. We all kind of know what we mean by stable ecosystems, all right? So here we have the full picture, all right? I call this, this isn't a circle, it's a pendulum. And we have chemistry at the apex of the pendulum. And going clockwise, you have the human-built world. And going counterclockwise, you have the natural world. And what's useful with this pendulum, if you look at that intersection on the bottom, that intersection on the bottom is an algorithmical way of assessing sustainability. What is the impact of the human-built world on the natural world and what is that intersection that allows us to really look at things however i'm a full member of the club of rome the club of rome back in the 60s had created the book limits to growth and Donella meadows in the early 70s started the whole field of systems thinking and uh so so i i look at these systems and i say man we need a lot of humility when we look at systems because no one is smart enough to get everything right and it's not the things we put on this that's going to come back to haunt us it's the things we leave out so when we do the assemble and disassemble there's leakage and that leakage ends up costing a little bit of sustainability because it creates porosity in that interface there's leakage during synthesis it creates more porosity we lose more sustainability during regeneration there's additional leakage and another loss of sustainability so we got to worry not only things happening exactly the way we plan and want but we got to realize that this leakage is going to come back to haunt us. Because when people put out these system maps, you very rarely see them saying, oh, and by the way, every once in a while, we're going to have an oil spill, or we're going to have plastics accumulate in the environment, or a train is going to derail in Ohio, exposing people to toxics, or we're going to have carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. These, interestingly enough, very rarely appear on people's maps. And we have to be just as conscious about that. All right, and so essentially, of if the way I, what worries me is that imagine if tomorrow everyone woke up and everyone said, "We want to be sustainable." Every person, every retailer, every manufacturer, every brand just said, "That's it, we're doing this." Well, I would argue today in 2023, maybe about 10 percent really are hitting all the marks. That there's a few low-hanging fruit that might help us. But right now, today, I'm worried that there's still 65 to 70 percent of the technologies haven't been invented yet. This concerns me that this isn't people choosing not to use these technologies. They haven't been invented. And the problem from my perspective is, yeah, we're doing manufacturing fine. We've got man we're, we're, mechanical recycling, we've got extraction and degradation, but and we can obviously do synthesis, but we're hurting in the molecular processing. We haven't figured this out. This is the unmet need. How nature can reprocess things, but humans can't. We need to invent this. This isn't going to happen by hoping and dreaming and wanting. This is an absence of skills. All right, and so essentially that is where the world of green chemistry, which I've given two Bioneers talks in the past that I go into green chemistry, so I won't do that again here today. But the point is that we're now at a point where chemistry is scary to the general public. You know, it's like the monster underneath the bed ready to come out and grab us, right? You know, just to think about open up the newspaper, turn on the radio, look on the internet. All we hear about is this is bad, this is bad, everything is bad. If if anyone's talking about chemistry, it's really not good. 
And think about that for a minute. What is our relationship between chemistry? If this is our critical unmet need, if we want to emulate nature, if we want to learn from nature, we need chemists to want to do that. And what I think we really need to understand is that Chemistry is everywhere. Imagine a Beyonce concert or a soccer match or Times Square. Now let's look at every object in this image. Every one of these objects probably has some patent, and that patent probably has some papers from academia. Now let's look at the faces of the people who did all this invention. They're not all crazy old white-haired men like me. There's a little bit of everybody there. It's not statistically proportional to the general population, and that we really need to work on, but we're all there. And that's really critical that, you know, the, the, the person you know, that's coaching your kid's, you know, at, you know, sports team might have invented an additive in your toothpaste. That someone that you passed on the street might have invented the drug that your dad takes for diabetes. That someone that sits in front of you in church might have invented an adhesive for your running shoe. Or maybe someone you passed in the airport invented a coating for the spatial. We inventors and chemists are all over the place. We're not weird, crazy people, but we're not interacting. Chemistry isn't doing a good job embracing society, and so we, society, need to kind of take a reevaluation of what this means to be a chemist and how to collaborate with nature to invent this future. All right, and so chemistry is evolving. When people say chemistry is a mature subject, I kind of laugh. We're just on the precipice of many, many things. And what's happening are people trying to define what do we want chemistry to be? We want it to be sustainable. We want it to be safe. We want it to be circular. We want it to be clean. We want it to be regenerative. All these things are great dis descriptions of state, of what we would like chemistry to do. Green chemistry is not another one of these loops. What green chemistry is, is an attempt to change the shape of chemistry so that more things get through. But to do this, we need new eyes and new ideas into the innovation process. We can't, Einstein said, no problem can be solved. The same level of awareness that created it. This is a clarion call for diversity. If we, the chemical sciences were more embraces of, of diversity 50 years years ago, we wouldn't be here talking now. It's not too late. I really believe that we can do this, but I am worried that we haven't invented enough yet. All right. And so who's going to invent this? And so that's why to me, what's so important of all the things that I do beyond benign run by Dr. Amy Cannon, we have what's called the green chemistry commitment, where we're asking chemistry departments to embrace green chemistry as part of the required curriculum. And we have now about 120 universities have signed. This is amazing. Last time I talked to you with a small number, people are self, uh, uh, you know, universities are now saying, yes, we want to learn this. So there is hope. There is optimism here. So I want to leave you with that sense of optimism that the world is changing that people are looking for new ways to do things. The next generation really does care. And so, yes, there is still a, a, a need for us to push the desire. But I'm worried about if we can accomplish that and everybody wants this, do we have the science and the technology to deliver it? And it's time for us to roll up our sleeves and make sure that we are creating these tools and what better teacher than nature Thank you very much for giving me an opportunity to speak with you, and I so wish I was here in person. Thank you.